So welcome everyone. Um, today's speaker is uh, Ronen Eldan, um, and with me today here is uh, Thomas uh, Vidik, and also helping behind the scene, uh, we have uh, Clément Canon, Anidia Day, and um, G. Kamat. Um, the, um, I mean, before, I, maybe before I go on, we should uh, see who's joining us today. Um, let's go around the table, um, Thomas. Sure. So uh, we have um, an India Day here joining with the group in uh, Chicago. Uh, then we have Dimitris Papas joining from University of Wisconsin. Welcome, guys. Uh, then we have a large group uh, with Grigori from, um, sorry, from Indiana University. Welcome, everyone. Uh, then there is um, a Naman Agarwal from uh, Princeton, uh, welcome. Um, then we have a group uh, with Piyush Srivastava from Caltech, uh, welcome guys. Next is Shravas Rao joining us from CWI. Then uh, we have uh, Sina who's uh, um, uh, joining from University of Michigan also, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Vladimir, uh, whose affiliation I'm not aware of, joining us. Uh, and finally, there is uh, Yu Chang joining us from USC. Welcome, guys. OK, I've been around okay. the table. Back to you, Dad. Welcome, Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, you might want to turn off, might want to turn off the uh, um, presenter mode if you're there. Yeah. Okay. I Okay, it's off. Good, good. Um, so uh, let me, uh, again, before uh, starting my talk, I'm just remind you that the uh, next week we have another TCS Plus with uh, Claire Mathieu. So it's next week, the same time. Uh, and the talk after that will be two weeks later with Bo Wagner. And um, uh, um, so that's, that's it for now. Um, we'll probably have a few more talks this semester. Um, uh, so again, as I mentioned, today's talk is uh, Ronen Eldan. Uh, Ronen graduated from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, his advisors were um, Vitaly Milman and uh, Boaz Klartag. Um, uh, on his webpage, he says he specializes in uh, LaTeX products. Uh, I think he does uh, also some math. Uh, he's done some fantastic work in uh, uh, symptotic convex geometry. Uh, and now he's done, nowadays doing more of, uh, uh, of uh, computer science. Um, so he later spent two years as a postdoc. He was at MSR Rainbow, uh, Redmond and the University of Washington. And I was a professor in uh, Weizmann Institute in um, Israel. So uh, I think we're ready to start. So uh, welcome, uh, Ronen. Let's see how the setup works. We're trying a new technology, 21st century uh, um, TCS Plus technology. Let's see how it goes. OK, Ronen, welcome. OK, hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, virtual place. Uh, can, I guess you can hear me. Can you see me writing something right now? I guess. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah, OK, good. So OK, let me start. So first of all, this is joint work with uh, Sebastian Bubek and Nint at Lee. They're both currently in uh, Microsoft Research. Redmond. OK, uh, so we're talking about uh, bandit convex optimization, which is kind of uh, a game played by a player and an adversary. So let's first understand what this, uh, what this game is. So the game goes like that. We have uh, a set omega. So omega is some set of choices that uh, the player can uh, choose at each turn. This can be either a discrete set or some subset of Rn, we'll see later. We have some fixed number t, which is just the number of steps uh, played during the game. And the game goes like that at each time step. So at each t between one and cap capital T, the adversary picks some uh, loss function. 
So a loss function is just some uh, function from omega to let's say zero one, which just defines uh, how much what the player loses by playing some point x in omega. The player at the same time chooses some uh, point xt in omega and basically suffers a loss lt at xt. Okay, and what is the objective of the player? The objective is to minimize the regret which is defined as follows. So the regret is just the loss, the accumulated loss that the player had. So the sum of all the losses in all time steps minus the least possible loss the player could have uh, accumulated by playing a fixed point. So the minimum over all points in omega of the sum of the losses at that point x. So this is the regret we care about. And there is one more thing that uh, we need to say. We need to say basically what the player knows. So when the player po picks the point xt, it has to base this on some uh, knowledge. And for this, we have basically two main settings. We have the so-called uh, expert or expert advice setting in which uh, the player basically knows all of the function LT. So it picks a point, it suffers a loss, but then it learns what would have happened if he had picked any of the other points in the space. So this is the expert setting. And we, he learns LT only after picking XT, right? Yes, of course. So the he, way he wrote play, it, he plays, way. okay, yes. So player uh, plays XT and then learns LT. Thank you. Good, and the bandit setting is the case where the player only observes what he has lost. So player, again, plays XT and then observes only the loss at the point that he played, so LT of XT, okay? Now, so expert setting, you can think about these problems as I have many experts, they're suggesting me certain uh, strategies, say financial strategies, and I pick one, but afterwards I can simulate all the other strategies and I know what would have happened if I had picked uh, any other one of them. Uh, bandit setting is more you can think about, say, online advertising. So when I have some uh, user going on my website, I can choose between several advertising strategies. So I can show him several uh, different ads. And in the end, all I know is whether he clicked or not. I have no idea whether or not he would have clicked had I shown him other ads. I only know whether or not he clicked on the ad that I chose to, sh to show him. So this corresponds to the bandit setting. Now, just to get a little bit of intuition, it seems like you know, the adversary can pick any functions LT. I have no uh, knowledge, I have no guarantee whatsoever about how L1 is related to L2 and to L3, etc. So it seems like by knowing some value at time T, there is very little I can say about what happens at time T plus one, etc. So just uh, for those of you who are new to these problems, um, just think about it like this. 
if there is a possibility to get some regret, so it, basically the, the, the point is the following. If there is some point X, which is better than all the other Xs in some way, then, you know, the adversary has no kind of no choice, but sometimes he's going to have, most of the times he's going to have to make X better. And this way we, the player, are, are, are going to be able to learn something. Somehow, if the adversary is doing something completely random, then he's shooting himself in the foot because there is no, there's gonna be no point which is better than the others. And we're going to have no regret because all of the Xs will be the same. So this is just a little bit of intuition. And now what settings can we play this in? So the most basic setting is when Omega is a finite set. So this is uh, well understood uh, by now. Um, there is an, I guess, the state of the art algorithm is by um, these guys. So it's uh, our Cesar Bianchi. Frunt and uh, Shapir. This is from O2. And basically what they show is that the regret you can have is uh, bounded by something like root of T, the size of omega times log of T times the size of omega. We'll talk a little bit about their algorithm soon. So, um, and it's pretty easy to see that by taking uh, just a random loss function, the regret you get is also going to be of the order root of the time steps, because just think about, I'm taking a random number between zero and one. It doesn't matter what the player chooses. The best point is going to be something like square root of the time steps better than just a typical point. So we also know that RT is at least square root of T times uh, log of uh, the size of omega, I guess. Uh, so at least in the, when you look at the dependence on T, this is tight. So this, this uh, case is well known and then you have uh, several, so you can look at this in the continuous setting. So is this uh, like a omega. Bandit or expert? Ah, sorry. So this is all, I mean, from now on, we only talk about the bandit setting. Okay. Okay. For expert, you can do a little better, but actually not much better. I mean, this lower bound, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's uh, bandit or expert. It's really the same because you don't really learn anything. Okay. So this is for the discrete setting. And then we these, can... Sorry. Um, yes. Uh, is that the best that is known? So there's a huge gap of size of omega in between the two bounds? Uh, yeah, so I think I might uh, be missing. Hold on. So I might be missing. There, there is a gap in the best thing that's known, yes, in the discrete setting. I think, yes, so, so we do have this. Uh, okay. But it is an exponential gap. I mean, it's a huge gap. Okay. Um, yeah, I might be confused. Yeah, no, I think, I think this is, uh, the best thing that's known. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, uh, then and, I have a question. Yes. So, uh, uh, in the bandit setting, unless you go for T equals Omega, uh, you possibly couldn't see any of the strategies, like all, all the strategies. Maybe there's one which is doing really, really well. 
can so, you say that again sorry yeah, yeah i'm saying uh, i'm saying unless until in the bandit setting until you go for t equals omega steps you couldn't possibly have explored like all the strategies like maybe there's a hidden one which is doing really well and you wouldn't yes. okay so how does this regret bound the upper bound on the regret uh, reconcile with that part so the lower bound of root t times um, the yeah, size so, of omega no so so the point is if omega is of the order t that, I mean, what you're saying is basically, if omega is as big as t, you couldn't have tried anything, everything, right? Right. If I understand you correctly. But yeah. then you see the regret. I mean, this bound is just, you know, it's it's at least as big as t, and we know that our loss function is bounded. So I mean, t is just a trivial bound. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Right. Okay, let me, let me just, so sorry, I, I, I just, um, now now I see, I, I was a bit confused before. So, so um, random in the discrete setting, this is what random gives you, but there's actually an example uh, given by these guys again, that the regret is at least, uh, can be at least uh, this thing. So, so basically this is tied up to the log, sorry. Okay, so so the discrete thing is known up to those uh, log factors, and then the next setting is where omega is uh, some subset of R n, and then clearly we can't say anything if we don't have some structure on L t because you know it could correspond to a discrete setting with infinite points but what if we know so two natural assumptions one is that lt is uh, linear and the other is that lt is convex so this one is called linear bandits this one is called convex bandits okay and so linear bandits let, let me just quickly mention a few works linear bandits is uh, well known by now. So these are works by uh, Danny Hayes and Kakade from 08, and then another work by uh, Bubek, uh, Cesabianchi, and Kakade from 2012. They show that uh, in the linear bandits case, uh, you have a regret. So I think the 08 one shows something like n to the 3 times square root of t. And then uh, the, the 2012 one shows just n to n times square root of t. And this, uh, this is tight. So for the linear thing, uh, we basically have uh, the full solution, and somehow the only setting that remained open was the convex setting. So for this, let me very quickly show you some history. So let me go back here, sorry. Okay. So this is, so the convex bandit somehow, the first papers uh, that looked at it are from 2004 and 2005, by one by uh, Kleinberg and one by uh, Brian McMahon. They both showed some, somehow independently and more or less at the same time that you have a bound of t to the three over four. The lower bound is, of course, again, uh, root t, because you can, uh, I mean, one obvious lower bound is, of course, root t, just by taking uh, random constant functions, say. Sorry, not constant, but functions that have at least two distinct uh, values which are separated by a constant. And then there is, uh, so this is more or less 10 years ago, there is a pretty long line of works 
as you can see, uh, the red uh, things are basically the state of the art bounds. So for linear, you have, as I said, square root of uh, n times square root of t, which is tight. And then there are several basically special cases that were considered for the bandit problem. So two natural special cases are the are the basically smooth case. So smooth just means that the Hessian of LT is bounded by some constant. So this is one kind of a, something natural to restrict ourselves to. And there is the strongly con convex assumption that the Hessian of LT again is now lower bounded by say some constant times the identity. And under these two assumptions, there is, uh, it was actually known uh, from 2014, this is by Hazan and Lee, that uh, you have, you have this, uh, square root of t bound, but basically the first uh, square root of t bound, so it turns out that in full generality, square root of t holds, and this was first uh, showed by this paper. So this is Bubek and myself. Uh, you, you have this bound, but this paper somehow, it follows a previous paper by Bubek, um, Bubek, Din, uh, De Bubek Offer, Dekel, Tomer Koran, and Yuval Paris, who showed the same thing for one dimension. Both of these papers are somehow information theoretic, so they don't provide an explicit algorithm. More or less at the same time at this, another paper by Hazan and Lee shows, uh, again, a root T bound, but somehow the bound depends exponentially on the dimension. So there, there, was, there is an explicit algorithm prior to this work, but the dependence on the dimension is exponential. And the work I'm going to present now is basically given the, the best thing one can hope for. So both square root of uh, t dependence on the number of time steps and um, polynomial in the dimension. And we also give uh, a polynomial uh, algorithm. OK, so this is uh, the, somehow uh, the history of this. Any questions so far? OK. So let me go back to. No, this well, is not it. In a sense of this, we're discussing the convex case, right? And say again, sorry. Yeah, so, so we're in the convex case. Um, does yes, the set yes. omega is the set omega also convex? Yes, yes, yes. The set omega has to be convex, otherwise it's kind of easy to see. That, I mean, it doesn't help much that the function is convex if the set omega is a few disconnected, you know, balls like this, yeah. then effectively yeah. you have something like a discrete set. But we're just, right. just what we have in mind is omega is convex and the uh, functions LT are convex. That's... Yes, yes. Okay. Omega is convex and LT are convex. Okay. So let me move on to some ideas of how to prove um, those bounds. And the first idea relies on a, an algorithm from the 80s, I guess, even before, but I guess in the 80s, it was people understood that. Sorry. That it can be used for this called the exponential weights. So Let's first try to understand what we can do if we have full information. So the expert setting. So 
So for full information, we have this uh, very elementary lemma, which is going to be uh, very helpful for us. So the lemma says the following. It basically tells us that it's a good idea to to sample from the following uh, distribution. So let's define PT. We'll, we're later going to sample XT from the distribution PT to be a distribution which is proportional to the exponent of minus some eta. So eta is going to be some constant whose value we were going to determine later, times the sum of all the loss we observed until uh, right now. So the sum over all, okay, i between one and t minus one of all of the loss we observed. So suppose we, we know the loss function, we just keep accumulating it and we play according to e to the minus the sum of this loss, then we have the following bound, which is basically follows from an easy calculation saying that if we look at the sum of the integral. Sorry, a question. Of, yes. Where are the loss functions being evaluated at? So basically in the bandit setting, we only evaluate them at the point we picked, right? So. All right, yeah, I understand that, but in, uh, but here, what are, what are you choosing? Because you left it as unspecified where the allies are being evaluated. Ah, sorry. So 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 maybe let, let, let me write it like this. I guess my notation wasn't clear. PT of X. This is the density of some measure. OK. And to know the density, I have to the evaluate LI at X. OK, got it. OK. OK. Thanks. Good. So now the lemma tells us that the, lo the, the regret that we have with respect to a point x, namely, if we take lt of x and integrate it with respect to pt of x dx, and we subtract lt of some fixed point y, then this is going to be bounded by the following thing. So this, is, this will be bounded by log, of course, let's sum it for all time steps. This will be bounded by log of P capital T plus one at X minus, sorry, at Y minus the same thing at time one over the learning rate plus again the learning rate times the sum over all t of the integral of the square of the loss function with respect to PT. So what does this uh, tell us? Let, I'll, I'll, I'll give, the proof is basically one line, I'll show it in a second. But what it tells us is that basically if we pick exponential weights as our strategy, so this strategy is just called exponential weights, then if we, pick eta correctly, 
then well we can have the following uh, thing so we know that lt is bounded so we can bound this term just by capital t together with the eta we get eta times capital t if we know that the that basically we didn't zoom in at a point too much so for example if we know that omega is not too big then well p1 of y can be at most one because p sorry p sorry p t plus one of y can be at most one because p is a probability measure this thing is at most the log of the size of our space so now if we optimize over eta we basically get that this is bounded by square root of log of the size of the probability space times t right by picking eta to be exactly the product of these two things so so this immediately gives us this square root of t bound for the full information case okay full information is, yeah. then is the uh, expert setting plus so uh, full information is the expert so the point is if we have the expert setting then we know then we can actually construct this uh pt of x but we somehow need to magically also know eta so eta is something we pick beforehand so in order to know eta so so this is true for the choice eta equal to one over square root of t log size of omega I think for the discrete setting. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me, so how can we pick eta? Isn't it just a normalization constant? So the other thing is a distribution? Like how can we choose eta? So so the point is I if okay, we know the number of st time steps in advance, and we know uh, the size of our space. So we're now talking about say the discrete setting. Then I, I'm just choosing eta so that the bound they have here on the right hand side. But, but shouldn't, be it, the, shouldn't it be a legitimate probability distribution over omega once you do that? That's a question. That, you know, integral over omega equals one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So the, the definition of PT is, is, I mean, this notation refers to. Uh, you know, so PT is equal to this up to some normalizing oh, constant. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. Good. So the proof is basically uh, one line. It's just the fact that, um, let me write it down. So the sum of PTLT minus LT of Y. If you check, it's just going to be equal to log of P sub capital T plus one at X minus log P one at X over eta plus one over eta times the sum of the expectation over x sampled from pt of e to the minus
So this is just a calculation. If you, if you just try to understand what the normalization constant of this thing here, you'll see that it exactly cancels out with one of the terms here. And then what remains is just this thing. So there is no, I think there is no point to do this. This is just a one line calculation. And then this thing, since we know that LT is bounded, then you see this is just, uh, well, this is, this just depends on the con convexity of the exponential function. Just think of e to the minus x as, you know, if you we look at e to the minus x and replace it by 1 minus x plus x squared and just use this with this identity, then we get exactly um, this thing here. Okay, so this is the proof of this thing. And now that we have this thing, this is going to be very used. This is basically the main ingredient for both the discrete and the linear bandit setting. So here is the nice idea that follows this. Whoops, what did I do? Sorry. So now suppose that we don't know LT and we still want to construct something that looks like this. Then Let's suppose that we can construct the, some function tilde LT, which we're going to think of as some uh, approximation of LT, which satisfies the following uh, three conditions. So, So first of all, let's suppose that it's an unbiased estimator for LT. So suppose that for every X, in expectation tilde LT is just equal to LT. Suppose also that the expectation of LT square of X is not too big. So suppose that it's smaller than some constant uh, C. And suppose that tilde LT depends only on X sub T where, let me remind you that X sub T was uh, sampled from PT. And again, PT is just proportional to E to the minus some eta times the sum of now tilde LT. So in the second yes. item, you need a square, right? You forgot a square? Oh, sorry. Yes. And this don't you mean, I mean, is that really what you mean? Because always at most uh, one. You know, if I... Well, it could be, well, oh. LT is at most one. Tilde yeah. LT is LT in expectation, but it could be, you know, it could be that the variance is very, very large. It could be that, okay, so, I mean, let, I, I'm going to touch the, this point very soon. But 
Do you know, you know so a, a priori, it, it doesn't right. tell you the fact that one happens doesn't tell you that two and, happens. And you really mean that it depends on an XT, not does not depend on LT of XT? Because it's a bandit setting, you do know. Or is before is before you choose the XT? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Of course, it depends only on, of course, on LT of XT. Sorry. So it it depends only on the information we have, which is exactly LT of XT. And of course, it could depend also on XT. OK? So now what we can do is the following. So we can use this lemma again, but I'm Sorry, just so one more question. Yes. Uh, in the last uh, line that you have, I'm a bit confused by that, by your indexing. So shouldn't it be that xt plus 1 is chosen according to pt? So because. OK, OK, so let me just um, just let, let me just remind you if, if I so what, what we wrote before is T here goes from one to T minus one. OK, so. No, my this point is, how is that you're constricting. So, no, so, so your, your point is exactly correct. I mean. The, the distribution PT depends only on the loss that we suffered in the previous steps. Yes, but why but, are you, so you observe LT of XT, and now you're yes. saying I'm going to sample yes. XT according to PT. Oh, I see, now it's fine. Yeah, you're yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's fine. I take you that observe back. LT, and only then you construct tilde LT. Okay, got it. Okay. Fine. Yes. Okay. Good. So now suppose that we know that, then what we do is we just go over here to the lemma and, well, we can replace um, LT by, by tilde LT everywhere. And since LT is, is equal to tilde LT in expectation, then if we put expectation here, then this is still equal to our expected regret. Right? So, so it doesn't matter that we replaced LT by tilde LT as long as their expectation is the same. We just invoke exactly the same lemma and we use exponential weights with an, the unbiased estimator for LT instead of LT itself. And now the question just becomes, how do we construct the tilde LT which satisfies all of the above? So the question becomes, how to construct tilde LT? So here is the very easy answer in the discrete case. I mean, once you know what the question is, the answer is very easy. Let's just define tilde LT of X to be the following. So let's take LT of X of XT, or maybe let me call this Y instead of X just so that this won't be confusing. Let's take LT at XT times the indicator that XT is equal to Y. So LT will be supported on XT. And now in order for uh, one to be correct, all we need to do is we want to divide this by the probability that XT is equal to Y or in other words, we want to define the, divide this by PT of XT. Or let's, let's write it PT of Y. It's going to be the same. And the point is, if you take the expectation of this thing, then this is just equal to 1, which means that the expectation of um, 
LT of Y is just, of LT tilde of Y is just LT of Y. Okay. I mean, if you may, may, maybe it'll be clearer if I replace this XT by Y as well, which doesn't change anything in the definition, but you see that if XT is not equal to Y, then I, we don't really need to know this thing. We just take zero. Okay, so this is the natural unbiased estimator in the, in the discrete case. There is a natural unbiased estimator also in the linear case. Um, actually, I don't have much time, so let me not mention it. But now, I mean, if we try to look at this idea and invoke it for the, and, and just kind of copy it to the continuous case, then, well, you see, if we have some continuous sub, some subset of Rn, and we try to construct an unbiased estimator like this, then this thing here doesn't really mean much. Right, I mean, somehow we just sample one point inside our domain. This is all the information we have. And, you know, we can only construct a function tilde LT. If we really need an unbiased estimator, then the only thing we can do is somehow construct a function tilde LT, which only knows the value at this point. And this is not helping us much. I mean, in other words, you can think about, you know, this denominator is going to be infinite. We can just take a delta function because we're not really not going to be able to make much progress this way. So the next idea, but le let me actually stop and see if any, does anyone have any questions so far? Is this more or less understood, the idea with the unbiased estimator? So there's just a... Okay. Maybe quick question. You didn't show us some the variance calculation here, so you. Um, yes, I, ag I agree. Your estimator. I, okay. Yes. Um, so, so this is a very straightforward cal calculation, okay. and if you do it, you'll see that the variance is is just, uh, just the size of our set of omega. Oh, so use that as a bound. Sure. Sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I mean, sorry, here is, uh, yes. Of, uh, did you mention what would be the bond um, in terms of n and t in the expert setting when we have exact estimates? I, I'm sorry, you were a bit interrupted. Can you repeat that? Uh, in the expert setting, uh, if l's are exact, what is the bond in terms of n and t? I see, in the convex case in the expert setting. Right. So, so this is actually pretty easy if you just invoke exactly the same lemma. So in the expert setting, you do have, you do know LT and you, do, you can do exponential weights and the bound you get is um, N to the three halves, uh, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. So, and this, this basically comes from uh, this thing here. And it, even that is sort of not necessarily optimal so, to lower so, bound n square of t, right? What's that? So even that is not Sorry. necessarily optimal because the lower bound is n times square root t, right? Yes. yes. No, okay, thanks. Right. Um, so so just just, just let, let me comment about this that I mean the the way to get a bound on on the on this difference between the logs of the probabilities in the continuous cases you can just think okay if lt is uh, bounded between 0 and 1 then you can it's not hard to see that you can assume you can also assume that it's um something like poly t lipschitz and if it's poly t lipschitz then well, you, you never have to uh, zoom in too much. In a sense, you can always assume that PT plus one is, uh, is somehow, uh, why can't I change the color here? 
sorry. So you can all, always assume that this thing is, um, is just uniform on a small ball of radius one over uh, t or something like that. And then, and then the log of the density will be something like t to the, I mean, sorry, the density will be like t to the minus n. When you take the log, you'll get n log t. So this, this only contributes a logarithmic term in t. Okay, I guess I have like five more minutes or somehow time passes uh, much more quickly on the internet. <laughs> Yeah, we, we know of that uh, relativistic effect. You can take 10 minutes, it's, it's okay. Okay, great. So, so here's uh, one idea. We l suppose we knew that uh, somehow we don't care about, we sampled here, but we don't care about small perturbations. So somehow, suppose we knew that if we sample from xt, this was just as good as sampling from some small neighborhood of xt. Then what we could do is, is we could do the following. So instead of taking this kind of, um, of an unbiased estimator, what we could try to do is, is, is say, OK, let's make L tilde t be Lt at xt times this delta at xt, which does not make much sense, but we could maybe do a convolution with some function h, where h is maybe some uh, small Gaussian centered around zero. And again, we could divide here by our probability to pick xt. This would basically give us an unbiased estimator, not for the function itself, but for, the, for a convolution of the function with some small Gaussian. Now, uh, this uh, may sound nice at first because you could say, okay, the function is continuous. Maybe I can perturb it a bit and everything will be fine. But there's two problems with uh, this idea. The first problem is that you see somehow we can't really apply a noise. So if, if this noise function h has some constant uh, size, so if we always apply some noise of radius uh, epsilon or something like that, then we'll never be able to zoom in too much. Somehow, if the optimum of, uh, of, well, if the point that minimizes our regret is this point y over here, and all we know is that the function is, say, one Lipschitz or even worse than that, then the, our only way to get something like a root t regret instead of some you know, some small constant times t regret is if we are really able to, in the end, so we really want to, in the end, zoom in to something of the scale of one over poly of t. Otherwise, there is no hope that we could be that accurate to only have root t regret, right? Root t regret means that at each step, we want only one over root t regret. So we definitely can't take a constant Gaussian or a constant noise. We somehow have to be smart. And as we zoom in, we have to adjust the noise. This is one uh, observation. And the other is, well, if we just do some convolution, then all we get is an information about some small neighborhood of the point that we sampled. Now, if you know a little bit about uh, geometry of high dimensions, you'll know that in order to fill up the space, you need an exponential number of such sets. It, if, if the diameter of... Uh, 
of our of of omega is say uh, one, and the diameter of our noise is epsilon, then we'll need something like e to the one over eps uh, to the n over epsilon samples until uh, sorry or something like sorry to something like one over epsilon to the n samples until we have information about every point in the space. So this is um, this is pretty bad. And let me just, I guess, in the one minute that I have left, let, let me say something. So I never, I haven't even gotten to talking about kernels. So the idea, the main idea in the new algorithm is to use some kernel which is adapted to PT. And, and to understand what that means, let me just really quickly, um, OK, I guess. Hmm. No, I think I don't. I, 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 don't, I don't have time to actually teach anything in these um, two minutes I have left. So, so I think five I'll stop minutes, here. Okay. Well then, five minutes. What's that? Tell us about, if five minutes okay, please tell us about kernels. Okay, okay, great. So uh, let me be really quick. So let's, let's, uh, let's say we have some k, which is a linear operator acting on measures in, um, in Rn. So by this, we mean if uh, p is a measure, then we define k of p is just the integral of, or, or k of p at x as the integral of k of some uh, function depending on two variables. So I'm, I'm allowing myself to freely change between uh, densities and measure. k takes the density p and returns the density kp. And and we can uh, just consider the um, a joint operator to k. So if k acts on a measure p, we can we want to define an adjoint operator in the sense that k p times a function f will be equal to p times k star of f. So if we want this to happen, we just need to define k star of f at y to be the integral of k x y f x dx. Now here is the um, idea. Suppose that we try to define this unbiased estimator l tilde t by by taking the following so we want to take some k of xt we want to find some kernel so that l tilde will be k of xt and y times l of xt over Well, let's let's write here q of xt and assume that our point is sampled according to a measure q. So so by definition l tilde of y is an unbiased estimator or or 
or in other words, I guess the expectation of L tilde T of Y. So you see that we take XT, but we do some kind of convolution with this kernel. You'll see the expectation just, just by, if you look at this definition, you'll see that the expectation is just Um, well, okay, the expectation of L tilde T, let me write it like this. This is just K star of L T. Do I have two more minutes or may, may, maybe let's... Um, yeah, but let's try to wrap up. And can we can continue later? We can, we can stay here and then we'll yeah, talk. Yeah, okay. So, so may, may, maybe... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, let, let, let me just say that somehow with an appropriate cho choice of kernel, I mean, what, what, what one gets is that you get, by applying just the, the exponential weight infrastructure, what you get is a bound for these loss functions and, and somehow what one needs to do is find a kernel that that somehow balances there between two things so first of all you want to say that bounding regret with respect to these loss functions uh, will imply a good regret with respect to the original loss functions and the the second thing you want is somehow that well the the that the variance of of the of your estimator is not too big. So so what so there is somehow a trade-off between doing a convolution with a large thing, which means that by sampling a point you learn something about a lot of points, which um which is uh related to, to a small variance of the estimator, but you also want to do a convolution with a small enough thing so that your kernel will allow you to actually zoom in to where you want. And let, okay, now, now, now let me really stop. Okay. Thank you, Renan. Um, any questions? Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yush, any question? No. Um, okay, so let's uh, let me just remind you. So thanks again, Renan. We everyone is welcome to stay here and chat um, offline. Um, let me remind you that the next talk is next week. Next TCS plus is next week at one p.m. Eastern, same time as today, with uh, Claire Mathieu. Um, so thanks everyone uh, for joining today, and hope to see you next week. And uh, let's um, go uh, offline. And uh,